Major Jason P. Lowry of the United States Space Force wrote this extremely dense book called Soft War, a novel theory on power projection in the national strategic significance of Bitcoin. And in an interview with Robert B. Love a couple months ago, Lowry said he wrote the book as a step-by-step -step guide for politicians, regulators, or anyone on how to win the argument that Bitcoin is a national security issue that needs to be addressed by the United States yesterday. He argues that this new technology is the next nuke and the fastest way to bypass all of the regulatory bureaucratic BS that is causing the US to fall behind as the global and technological superpower in the world is to take the issue out of the hands of the likes of Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, SEC Chair Gary Gensler, who do not understand warfare by using this book to prove Bitcoin is a national security issue and catapulting it to the hands of the Department of Defense. Is Major Lowry on something? Are other global powers already privy to this concept? Is that why Russia and China have recently pivoted and have become top Bitcoin hashers? Well, it's possible because this book was printed and available to anyone around the world in February of 2023. And as of a few weeks ago, the Pentagon told Lowry to remove it from publication. Here's a tweet from Lowry on July 27th about the situation. For those asking what's going on with me, I was ordered to take soft war down and asked to stop talking about the subject publicly. Doesn't appear on MIT's library either. Can't talk details, but things are good and I'm working hard behind the scenes. Appreciate the kind words. As some of you may know, I ordered the book when it first came out and I've got a printed copy. So in this video, we are going to break down Lowry's thesis together about the national strategic significance of Bitcoin. So there are a few concepts we need to explore together to help us fully grasp the gravity of the theory. So let's start with physical security of scarce resources. Here on Earth, everything is in constant competition for scarce resources like food, territory, energy, shelter, a means to reproduce like a mate and similar. And every single thing alive in the world today succeeded at living and reproducing by using physical force or imposing a physical cost on predators, competitors, and any other living organism that was competing against them for food, territory, the ability to reproduce, etc. And to describe what imposing physical cost means, Lowry uses an equation where he explores the ROI, or return on investment, of attacking something, and considers the ratio of the potential benefits or rewards from attacking something compared to the potential costs or downsides of attacking something. For example, what are the potential benefits versus costs of trying to harvest the scarce resource of honey from a beehive? Well, over time, bees have optimized themselves to reduce their vulnerability to attacks and secure their food resources by imposing physical force on attackers by swarming and stinging them. And we can also imagine how this plays out across all of nature when considering most animals at the top of the food chain have pointy teeth, sharp talons, big claws, lots of muscles, strong bones, etc. All attributes that increase their ability to increase the costs or downsides of something that may try to attack it and increase their ability to secure scarce resources like food, territory, etc. Nice. Now with humans, the same concepts apply but play out in multiple domains in civilization due to our complexity, intelligence, psychology, physiology, and a myriad of factors. In those domains where we impose physical force against each other, on a global scale, our land, water, air, outer space, and now, as Lowry points out, in his thesis, a new domain has emerged called cyberspace. So in each of these domains, to decrease our chances of being attacked, there must be a consequence. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to maintain control and security over and access to valuable resources essential for survival, like land, food, energy, natural resources, ports, etc. And as unfortunate as it may seem, warfare is the last resort to secure our resources if laws, policies, treaties, or agreements break down between different countries, civilizations, or similar. And we see it every day in nature. Lions don't negotiate terms with the gazelles when they are hungry, they just eat them. Snakes don't refer to contracts or similar between their prey, they just eat them. If a pack of wolves controls some territory and then another pack of wolves shows up, they don't have a civil conversation about where boundaries are or about sharing resources. They bark, growl, snarl, and ultimately, if it comes down to it, engage in warfare through physical force to try to secure their territory. So humans experience these same situations if we spend time developing irrigation and farmland, the only way we can secure it is by imposing a cost of attacking it with physical force. Throughout time, that has looked like spears, swords, arrows, and eventually guns and so forth. 
So the function of warfare is physical security over scarce resources to establish pecking order, settle disputes, and similar. Resources in life are scarce, so life has to fight for the limited resources to survive. However, over time, the form of warfare has changed. In modern society, we outsource warfare, or physical security or force, to the military, police forces, and similar. So while most of us do not participate in applying physical force to secure resources, war still wages on every day around the world. In the domain of land, we have armies that impose physical force on any attackers, or the armies impose physical force to try to secure land we may not currently control, depending on the cost and benefit ratio of attacking a particular area. In the domain of water, we have the Navy that imposes a high cost of physical force on attackers like pirates to ensure our ports are secure and we can successfully trade across the ocean with other countries. In the domain of air, we have the Air Force that ensures we have access to this domain and that it is secure from potential attackers by guaranteeing a very high cost of attacking it with jets, missiles, drones, etc. In the more recent domain of space, we now have a space force that ensures we have access to space and can secure our resources by the threat of imposing physical force on anyone who tries to deny our access or threatens our resources. So at the end of the day, handshakes, policies, agreements, etc. are not enough to ensure we have freedom of access to our land, water, air, and space because, as we've discussed, there needs to be physical cost and a threat of physical force to protect ourselves from attackers. This is how civilization works, and even though warfare sucks, a key benefit to warfare is it ensures decentralization of control over resources where no one centralized person, entity, country, or government has control over all of the land on Earth, all of the rivers, seas, and oceans on Earth, over all of the airspace and outer space. And when or if a Hitler or similar tries to gain more power over any domain like land, it becomes extremely expensive and energy and resource intensive for them. Warfare is also a way to escape oppression and that if something starts to oppress you, warfare is how you prevent and escape from it. Cool. Now what happens when civilizations expand its footprint into the new emerging fifth domain of cyberspace? And what role does Bitcoin play as potentially the most efficient weapon ever built that doesn't kill or physically harm anything? Hello, I'm Crypto Casey, and in this video, we are going to explore Major Jason P. Lowry's theory on the strategic significance of Bitcoin. Let's hit it. Please be sure to check out our sponsors, Kraken, Masterworks, and Tangem Wallet. Hit the crypto gym and learn how to use Kraken Pro's latest advanced trading platform to take full advantage of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity as an early crypto adopter before the next bull cycle. Diversify your investment portfolio with the time-tested, uncorrelated asset class of fine art with Masterworks platform and invest in your very own cold storage hardware wallet like Tangem Wallet. It's the size of a credit card, multi-currency, multi-chain, and it's by far the easiest crypto wallet to set up and use on the market right now. Tangem has been swamped, so orders have been backed up for a few weeks. Pre-order one to get your spot online today for the next batch of wallets. Scroll down and use links below to access the correct and official sites as well as redeem any special offers they have for us. Sweet. Marshal Ferdinand Foch, who went on to become the Supreme Allied Commander in World War I, declared in 1911 that airplanes are interesting toys, but of no military value. We remember his words in the 1990s only as a classic mistake in judgment. Yeah, it wasn't until Japan launched an airstrike on Pearl Harbor in World War II when we realized we needed to pivot from building more ships to building an armada of airplanes. The US also experienced this with nuclear weapons, as showcased in the new Oppenheimer movie, where we barely won that arms race by mere months. The world would have been a much different place right now if Germany had beat us to the nuclear weapons punch. So when the threat of asymmetric power exists, we must adapt or die. Airplanes and nukes were the new forms of power projection through the airspace domain that the US almost dropped the ball on. And there are blind spots all across history with other forms of physical force like gunpowder and cannons where humans extrapolated from the past and didn't recognize new areas of threat or new forms of warfare. So is Bitcoin the latest form of power projection through the new domain of cyberspace, where valuable resources like data, artificial intelligence, financial records, etc. need to be secured or else they will be exploited. How can we ensure, like the land, water, air, and space, that cyberspace remains decentralized and not controlled by a single person, country, corporation, or entity? Therein lies a national security issue. So according to Lowry, if we want to protect our data, 
we need to impose a cost of attack on the data. We need something that converts physical power into a form that we can weaponize to impose costs on an attacker. Because over time, in recent years, computing has become extremely efficient with hardly any costs. And this makes hacking and spamming way more popular because the cost of attacking computer systems is low. Spammers can fire bots all over the internet at hardly any cost, and hackers actually use the logic built into programming languages and exploit them. And programmers fix what hackers exploited with more logic, and then hackers endlessly find new ways to exploit the logic with more logic, which is at hardly any cost to the hacker. So when thinking about what kind of high physical cost we can impose on hackers and spammers to deter them from attacking computer systems, Lowry believes Bitcoin may offer the solution. While computing has gotten cheaper and more efficient, Bitcoin's proof of work consensus mechanism makes computing more expensive and difficult. In this case, this reverse optimized computing costs a lot of energy and money to send information across the network. So with Bitcoin, the cost to attack the network is extremely high to the point where attacking it in a meaningful way that is sustainable longer than 20 minutes or so is not really possible. In fact, here is a response from Bitcoin expert and legend Andreas Antonopoulos answering a question about what would happen if a 51% attack on the Bitcoin network occurred, the cost associated with it, and the more than likely outcome in the end. Check it out. Just a quick follow up on that. Do you have any concerns about a large nation state that has interest in just actively destroying Bitcoin to make their own you know, super rigs and uh, design chips and just throw hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to intentionally disrupt the blockchain? Yeah, I, I don't worry about that at all. Um, this cannot be done with Bitcoin anymore. This is something that can only be done with nascent altcoins. Uh, Bitcoin has achieved a, a level of computing that uh, no single nation state can, uh, can overthrow it through computation alone. Uh, the effort to do so would require a massive covert operation of chip fabrication, uh, then the coordinated assault that would give them dominance over the next block for 10 minutes until we kick those bastards off the network, uh, rework the protocol around them, they would be revealed, they would have lost a billion dollars doing this, and all they got to do was one double spend. <laughs> Now here's the thing, long before we get to that point, they figure out that if they just let this stuff run, they can actually get some Bitcoin <laughs> as a reward, because the incentive structure actually works. And so I'm not worried about that. And a lot of people are watching the blockchain. And as I said before, what are they going to do? So they take over and they fork the blockchain and they go somewhere, right? They've created an alternative blockchain. Great. What are we going to do? Who's going to join the NSA blockchain? <laughs> Anybody want to jump on Fedcoin? <laughs> so we're all going to stay on the old fork. Difficulty will go down. It will get more profitable for the miners who stayed behind, and we'll carry on with our coin, and they can go mine whatever the hell they want on their alternative blockchain. They achieve nothing. They can't make protocol changes because, we, as I said, five constituencies in consensus and it would take a billion dollars to pull the most ridiculous Keystone Cops failure in history. <laughs> Plus, this would actually require government that can do IT. <laughs> Amazing. So data and AI are modern day precious resources that reside in the new domain called cyberspace and we need to secure it by projecting physical power to increase the cost of attack ratio, like what we see already fully functioning with the fully decentralized Bitcoin network. With the Bitcoin blockchain protocol, we can project physical power in cyberspace with watts via electricity, making Bitcoin not just a coin or new financial asset, it's a new form of warfare to protect, secure, and decentralize data, AI, and other things that operate within the cyberspace domain, like drones, aircraft, rocket ships, nuclear weapons, etc. So although people have been saying Bitcoin is an interesting new toy, but offers no value to the military or warfare, they've possibly changed their tune in light of the Pentagon pulling Lowry's book about the strategic national significance of Bitcoin off the shelves. Lowry draws a comparison between nuclear weapons and the implications of using Bitcoin to secure data, AI, and all kinds of resources in cyberspace by pointing out 
how nukes are the most efficient way to destroy and cripple another country, yet it's too inefficient and costly to use because it would destroy everyone and everything, basically the whole game board, because of how many different countries have them at their disposal. With drones, AI, and a ton of resources and activities moving into the new cyberspace domain, the future of national security is cybersecurity. And if Bitcoin is the answer to the problem of projecting physical power in cyberspace in order to impose costs on attackers to deter them and secure important resources, Bitcoin may very well be the most efficient weapon ever built because it secures data, money, property, resources, etc. better than any other form of warfare, all without killing anyone or harming anything. So what does this all mean for crypto investors like us? Well, an absolutely face-melting bull season is on the horizon. We need to hit the crypto gym now and train together in order to take advantage of our once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-generation opportunity to generate and secure a massive amount of wealth in crypto. Because when Bitcoin is rocking and rolling, altcoins start exploding with much more potential for insane gains. If we are veterans in the space and proficient in advanced trading, or are just starting to develop new skills, Kraken Pro is extremely customizable and offers a wider variety of options we can use to leverage and hedge so we can get more creative and efficient with our overall trading strategies. Kraken Pro has low spreads, which lowers our average cost per trade. It has deep liquidity across markets, which allows us to trade large volumes at stable prices. And it offers us high rate limits, where we can trade crypto fast using their robust low latency API. In eligible regions around the world, they offer spot margin trading where we can trade crypto with up to 5x leverage, which amplifies exposure to volatility, giving highly experienced and expert traders more flexibility when executing advanced trading strategies. Also in eligible regions, Kraken offers futures trading where we can expand our crypto trading experience with over 100 plus perpetual futures with some of the lowest fees among crypto trading platforms. So whether we are new or experienced, Kraken is a perfect platform we can use to practice trading and become more knowledgeable about advanced trading strategies. Awesome. If you would like to watch a guide for beginners about what the Bitcoin halving event is and how it has affected the price historically, check out this video. If you would like to finally have that eureka moment about how Bitcoin works and how it can help us maintain complete control over some of our wealth, check out this video. And to get your very own Tangent wallet, click on the link on the screen. Like and subscribe for more. Be safe out there.